welcome Marie Therese Wolf from uh, for this uh, the last talk of this morning session. She is going to talk about social economic application. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and um, yeah, thanks for letting me come and talk about my work. So um, I decided to talk about two topics. So um, I think you've seen already a couple of applications of both one type equations in socioeconomic models. So the classical things go back to wealth formation, uh, so modeling wealth <coughs> and um, opinion formation. And so I thought, okay, Let's talk about some more, I mean, it's, it has continued, but other than, um, applications that I've been working with on. And so this is a joint work, a couple of people involved in the, just to give you an idea, and I will start with some very recent work on a ranking model, which was proposed in 2015 by Luca in Japan. And um, I will tell you in a minute what it is all about. So the first part will be uh, self-contained, as I said, the question is, okay, how do I rank um, things and how can we use actually ideas from both kinetic theory to um, describe this kind of ranking or rating behavior. The second part will be about a different model that was proposed actually by economists. So this was not something mathematicians came up with. So um, it's a coupling of a Boltzmann equation and a mean field game. And so this is the second part. In the first part, this is joint work with Bert von Düring and Marco Doregossa. For PhD student. And um, in the second part, this is joint work with um, Martin Burger and Alex Lord. Okay, so who of you is playing chess? So I think you know the ALO rating system then. <laughs> okay. If you're playing soccer, you might know it as well. I'm not playing, but if you're interested in soccer, you might know it as well. So the idea here is okay, we have players, and the players say, <coughs> compete against each other and we want to know, okay, what is the correct ranking or the, what is a, a vehicle? and we want to have a number, how we rank them and how we kind of relate to their strengths. And there was a physicist, he was from Hungary, back in the 1950s, if I'm not mistaken, so Iso, that was his name, and he also kind of, that's how the name came into play. And he wanted to, uh, he wanted to calculate this relative <laughs> skill of players. And the original idea, so he developed this for chess, and so you have players, they compete in zero-sum games, so two chess players competing against each other, and you want to rank them who is the best, and so on. And, as I said, it was developed for chess, but nowadays, in 2018, the FIFA decided that they actually abandoned the ranking, or the way they did it, and also moved to the EO ranking. The American Football Association is using it now. Um, online gaming, so I think in World of Warcraft, with one of those games, you will be ranked um, according to uh, the ELO algorithm. Also, table tennis, haven't looked that much into it. So, if we go now on web and have a look, okay, uh, there's a, quite a bit of discussion if, uh, for example, for soccer, if this should have been done. Um, the FIFA adapted the ELO ranking score, so you find now web pages where they compare. What was the old FIFA rank and what is the now used ELO ranking? So this is the ELO rank. And you can see some countries that do better. So for example, if you're in Germany, you have an ELO rank now of six, and this is used. In the old FIFA ranking, it would have been 13. So well, you kind of good, so to say, start for the UK. Um, I think, well, we would have been on, or we, I love, but they would have been on the fourth place. But here they are the fifth. And England. Uh, here, here it's in there. Ah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I'm going down here. You see my, my, my Austrian colleagues here. So, FIFA rank, we would have done much better. 34, unfortunately, we're not 43. So, I mean, you can have a look. These tables are updated and calculated regularly. So, in 2018, they switched, and nowadays it's kind of still in between. So, how do we rank? What are the best teams? Well, um, even for Brazil, it seemed that it was three, and here it's one. Okay. Uh, if you look at the numbers, the inner rank usually goes from something around 1,500 to 2,500. So this is the numbers that we have, but we can scale them accordingly. Okay, so how can we use um, kinetic theory, or how can we describe, so to say, um, this ranking? And there was a paper by Juncker and Chabat back in 2015 mm -hmm. where they proposed the following. So we do have players and we characterize them by two things. They have an intrinsic strength. This is something that it's not observable. I mean, how good I'm playing, that's depending on my skills. And I have 
and then the outcome of the game will, will depend on it. <laughs> and then I have an official rating, which kind of um, then <coughs> yeah. weighs how good I played. And what they said is, okay, in each rating, uh, in each game, so two players meet. So I have RI and RJ, you know, the pre-collision or pre-game rating. And after each game, I'm updating the rating. And this is also done in the, in the original Edo um, algorithm, which is fully discrete. But, I mean, it pretty much encodes what you're seeing here. So this is pretty much just translating how, um, what is actually done. So after the encounter, you update the ranking, this SIJ is the outcome of the game. So it's plus one if player I wins, it's minus one if player J wins. <coughs> so you see, either one of them, some other ranking changes. And this function B is the mean score of the game. So, and it says that actually, um, no, this is the difference between the rankings. So. <coughs> okay, so what is the mean, uh, the mean score of the game? So you're playing this game and you say, okay, the outcome of the game should be related to the difference in the strength. So to say, if I'm playing against a strong player, then the difference in this game is that it's more likely that the strong player is going to win. So um, if you look at this function, this is a tangent hyperbolic, so it goes up to the, from 0 up to 1. So um, this, in expectation, it should represent, so to say, the difference in the strength. And what they showed is actually, this is the model that they proposed. The B is our tangent hyperbolic. This is how you update those rankings. And if you want to find a stationary state of the system, the only possible stationary state that you will obtain in the system is if actually your um, uh, rankings converge, so to say, to your strengths. And that's what they showed, and I will show this to you in a minute. But in principle, you play, you get the score. The score depends on the difference between your um, strengths levels. You update the ranking and in the end you want to know, okay, is this going, so to say, converging? Is my ranking converging to the strengths? <coughs> and in this paper bound here, they showed, okay, if you have interactions, so everybody is playing against everyone, you can show in the long term run that actually your rankings are going to com uh, converge to your strengths. So strengths in this setting is not changing. We have the rankings, we adapt them depending on um, the outcome of the game. The gamma is some kind of scaling parameter. And you do the full machinery, and I will show it later on for an adaptation that we considered. But um, what you do is usually you derive the so-called quasi-invariant um, gaming limit. I don't know, no scaling limit in this case you get a focal plug equation. So in this case, if you look at this limit in the long term run, the distribution of the players, they are a function of your rating, of the strengths, but it's not changing, um, satisfies this equation here. And on the right hand side, you can see that you adapt, so to say, your, um, uh, the density changes due to the difference of the rankings and the strengths. You see here a function w which pops up, and this is um, an additional term which you want to include, and sometimes it makes sense that you say, okay, um, you're only going to play against somebody if your rankings are, so to say, similar. So you're not allowed to that, or you probably don't want, that somebody just starting to play chess plays against the chess master. master. And so it's kind of the sense that, okay, if you're sufficiently close in rankings, you can kind of weigh this and say, okay, I'm only allowed to play against individuals which do have a similar ranking. So this was this first paper, and what they showed was, okay, my rankings converge towards the strengths, if everybody plays everyone, so W is equal to 1. And this is actually quite nice, because um, back then, so when the model was introduced, there was always this big question, so now I'm going to update these rankings, but do they really represent the strengths? How fast does it go? And you, uh, when somebody enters the competition, you need to assign some kind of initial ranking and you would like to know, okay, is this actually really representing what is going on? And so this was, it was analyzed statistically back then, this was, so to say, the first proof. Even so, yes, it's a bit of a stylized mathematical setting, and, but it has in principle all the ingredients that are in the ELO score. Okay, so when we had a look at this paper, we thought, okay, yeah, that's, Really nice, but what if your strengths changes? So here I have a rating that is adapted after each game, 
but I also have a strength. And my strength, it might, for example, change due to, I don't know, daily conditions. So if I'm a soccer player, I'm probably not on top all the time. I might also learn in games. So if I'm playing and I'm playing against somebody and um, I win, I might get some benefit because the more I practice, the better I get. So somehow the natural thing to do was, okay, let's consider um, the situation where you actually can change your strengths, it changes also in, 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 the, in the games. So this was the starting point, what we had in this uh, for, so to say, a model which has dynamic strength. So you can say you have some learning or um, how you want to describe it. So in addition now to the original ELO update, where we update the rankings, we now say, okay, I do have my pre and my post collision strength. And I, first of all, let's say there are some fluctuations because, yeah, as I said, my daily performance is not always the same. So we said, okay, let's add some small random variables. They have mean zero and certain variants. And then we introduced also a function which represents learning mechanisms. And what in principle this learning mechanism says is that um, depending on the difference in the intrinsic in our strength, I benefit more, for example, if I'm competing against somebody and winning a game and this was a strong player. So if I play now against somebody who is much better than I am, and then I will take probably much more out of the game. While the person that is actually the stronger player and if it's beating the other one, well, I mean, that's not that hard of a task. So you can play here with these functions h1 and h2. So um, I wrote down some choices here. In general, we will assume that the h1 and the h2, they are odd function, positive, and um, the h2 is bounded. So I'll show you a picture. And what does this tell us, for example, is that the h1 so to say, I will always, so to always increase my strength. So if I have an alpha which is larger than zero, then this function is going to tell me that both players, they gain in the competition. So it, it, no matter if they lost or not, they're kind of going to win. Now, if I'm adding this h2 function, which tells me, okay, if I'm actually a player who is very strong and I'm playing against somebody that's weak and I'm going to lose, then I should probably be punished a bit for that. So you can see here this combination sometimes may lead to, to, to the fact that you have a negative value here. So the stronger player, if it loses, so to say, it kind of, uh, it's not, if it's he or she is losing the game, then um, the strength is kind of lower. But there are, you can choose whatever you want. We were thinking, okay, let's make it a bit realistic. And the more you, do you benefit more, if you were a weaker player, you might be punished, so to say, if you're the stronger player and if you're going to lose. Okay, then you can do a similar thing as um, Juncker and Jabeur did. So we start now with, we want to describe the evolution of all our players with respect to the strengths and the ratings. So rho is always my, we remember the strengths, r is my rating. And one can show that actually now the distribution of all the players with respect to the ratings and the strengths, it satisfies this Boltzmann equation. Here we have our test function, so these are the gains and loss terms where we then have to plug in the interactions that are just the binary interactions that I defined before. I think you've seen this a couple of times. Here you also see this weight function or interaction rate function. And um, as I said, this is this kind of function that we're going to use if do you want to kind of only ensure that people with a similar ranking are allowed to play. Uh, you can make this smooth if you wish, or um, more intuitively say, okay, I'm only allowed to play if I'm sufficiently close to somebody. Okay. Uh, what can we do say about this model? First of all, um, I'm not destroying or creating any players, so you can. Um, plug this in, do a little bit of analysis, so a combination of mass. Um, if we look at the moment, so we define the moment, first order, higher order moments, with respect, so we have two variables, we have the ratings and we have the strengths. Then the mean value with respect to the ratings is constant in time, so what you do is you differentiate this expression, plug in um, the Boltzmann equation, do a little bit of um, Cancelling, and you might remember since you have this row ij minus, so 
they are odd functions, often the term cancelled, and you see, okay, this is going to um, be equal to zero, so it's not changing. And you can also show that the second order, um, the second moment is bounded here. What you see for the strengths is something that is somehow now inherent in the model is that um, it's actually, if my function h is bounded, you can show that this is growing in time. And it somehow makes sense because if you remember this h1 function, you, um, first of all, we include, in, include the diffusion uh, as these random variables, and second, you learn in every game. So to say, unless you penalize it very much, this h2 function could be chosen such that it's negative. So your strength is going to grow and grow and grow and grow, which is, let's say, a bit questionable, but you can also already see it here in the moment. <laughs> Sorry, Lucrezia. So, what's the domain of rho and r? Um, okay, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. So, we initially started to, uh, it's the whole domain. So, here we are in full, full space. So, we did um, start out, it's a, it's a good question. So, in, when you think about the, the application, actually, the rankings, they live between 1,500 and 2,500, so you can scale this, so you could say bounded domain. But then you have to deal with all the boundary terms, which, well, you don't. <laughs> so we, we said here, we did it on the whole space. For the existence proof, actually, I will show you in a minute for the quasi invariant scaling limit. Um, we wanted initially to do it on the whole domain, but we could not prove that we have a sufficient to k towards infinity. <coughs> so for this, we actually did it on the bounded domain. Um, but here, it's full space, hard to. Uh, okay, so but since this equation, as I said, it's a Boltzmann equation, it's not so nice to handle, it's often helpful to study it in certain limits, and what you do is this quasi-invariant scaling limit, uh, interaction limit, so to say, sorry. So um, you let this gamma, this gamma is the, the scaling parameter that we had in front of our binary interactions, tend to zero, and the diffusion tend to zero such that this ratio is constant. So this has been done before quite many times. And we derive in this setting, similar to the first slide that I showed you, again, a Proca-Planck equation. Now, this term is the same as we had. This was this original version of the Juncker and Jabbar model. While here now I have two additional terms. I have one term which comes from this um, random fluctuations in the strength. This gives me, by the way, the square should be gone here. It's just, I mean, it's the second derivative. <coughs> uh, which gives me um, a diffusive term. And then I have here, this is the change in my intrinsic strength, which depends, so to say, on our learning methods. <coughs> so now I have a function, or fun is the function f, it's a function of the ratings and the strengths, and we adjust in, in both directions, depending on the, on the difference, so to say, between players. And um, here it should be rho minus rho j. This is a lower. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, now, what can we say about the stationary states? <coughs> so also on the focke planck level, you will see that um, we have actually no steady state. First of all, this system is anyway, also the original um, ELO model is invariant with respect to translation because all these functions, they always depend on rho i minus rho j. Here, as I already said, we have this fact that we always have um, a continuous increase of the strength in time, so I can't, so to say, expect that the system is going to converge towards a stationary state or a steady state. Which is somehow, well, one could say, okay, you did a bad job in the modeling, you should have kind of limited your strengths. Uh, yeah, that's also a good point. But at that, we thought, okay, let's keep it the way it is. We say we learn the games. And we try now to rescale the system in such a way we just shift it because it's anyway it's translation invariant to the original formulation. And let's say what we can say about the shifted state. Uh, shifted sub problem. So okay, we have here we say that the, the moments here it, with respect to the rating it's not changing, but we see it again here, the rating, uh, the moment with respect to the strength, um, it's positive, it's increasing. So now, okay, let's shift this problem and try to um, ensure that it's actually 
um, both of them are equal to zero, then I can expect that it converges towards um, a steady state. You can calculate a suitable shift. So this is the shift. You do the analysis. In the end, I mean, what you should take home is you now have a function instead of f, which is called g. It has the same terms, except that you have to modify your learning or this kind of the increase function in strength is now updated in such a way that the mean is going to be, or the average is going to be zero, so that I can expect actually that this equation that I will have is a steady state. So this is just so today a suitable shifted um, learning mechanism here in the strength variable. Other than that, it's just the same as the function that we have for f, uh, equation that we have for f. Okay, uh, looking at this equation, actually uh, you have to think, or you might want to think, okay, does it have a solution? And the question, as I said, we wanted to do it on the full domain first, but uh, we had problems to kind of get, to ensure, at least we could not see it at that moment, how we can make sure that we have decay <coughs> and infinity. So what we did instead was we said, okay, let's consider bounded domain. <coughs> And let's assume that I have some uh, Neumann boundary conditions, so nobody is going to vanish or is going to, to, to run away. And then you can show that if you have sufficiently nice initial datum and so on, your functions, your interaction functions are sufficiently nice as well, that you do have a weak solution to your problem. Um, what you do is you regularize um, you lean, uh, the problem, then you linearize, fixed point argument, and so on. So, it took a little while, I'm not going to go through the details, but you can prove actually that this model has a solution. So, actually what I wanted to show you now is how you can compute this, because I wrote a little bit of script where you can show what's going to happen in the case where, if we start with this original ELO model. So, what this graph or this plot here shows you is the steady state. And um, you can show, well, as I said, that's the proof in the, the original work that the rankings will converge to the steady state. So the, what, they, what I did here is I start with a uniform distribution of rankings. Um, yeah, rankings. You just hold, throw a whole bunch of particles. You do a Monte Carlo simulation if you do it on the focal Planck level. And then you let them interact. So you run an MCMC, so to say, and average of a whole bunch. I, I would have showed it to you. I thought, in the, yeah, the problem is my laptop. It doesn't it work, so it did not communicate with this thing. Um, but in the end, what you will observe is this line. <coughs> so this means that actually the rankings have converged to the strength. So they accumulate at the diagonal, which gives you actually that they really converge towards the real um, strengths of the players. How you can also prove this, so in the paper how what they did is, they had a look at this energy functional. This energy functional is, I mean you can use another energy as well, it has to be, you can put a function here, which is a function in terms of rho minus r, and then you can show that this is actually decreasing, and then this gives you, so to say, an argument you can prove actually that they really converge, and that's what's also done in this um, paper by Yuka and Java. In our setting, the situation is a little bit different. Um, we can't prove it. We actually we always get that this is larger than um, zero. And we expect actually that we have some kind of accumulation of the mass around the diagonal. So it's always due to this diffusion to be smeared out. It's not going to be this really nice straight line as I've shown you. Um, what would we expect? So I can show you some simulation results. Unfortunately, I can't show you how you get them, but that's what you obtain. So if you have no diffusion and you start with this is a really brilliant uh, resolution here, um, you start with a uniform distribution. And what I did is now I did the simulation of the uh, this is the Fokker-Planck equation for G, and I have no diffusion in there. And if I have no diffusion, I come expect that it will converge towards the same data Dirac at the center of mass. Since I started with a uniform distribution in 0, 1, the center of mass is at 0 0.05, so this is beautifully converging. Um, here, if it's quite hard to see. This is time, this is the energy, 
and it's decreasing uh, exponentially fast. So you might just want to imagine in this case, in both cases, you will see uh, an exponential energy decay. But if you have diffusion, I mean, you, you are not going to see this um, kind of that it really converges towards a delta P rock at the center of mass because of the diffusion, it's kind of smeared out. And um, so this is the steady state that we observe. You can, by the way, try, I mean, what we did back there was we tried different kind of formulations for this steady state and plugged it in into the equation for G. All of them gave <coughs> us some, the some way or the other, they contradicted the formulation. So you can't, so to say, uh, can't find such a trivial steady state. Um, you can also play a little bit, and this is a bit hard to see as well. But what is this kind of thing? So what we, we did here was that we wanted to understand what's happening if I'm going to spread. So the first situation was all play all. All play all means W is equal to 1, so every player can play against the other one. What if I'm going to limit this? So if I have only limited interactions, then um, it's kind of the, the situation is going to change. And in this picture, what we had initially, so you have th those two show the same. This is just from the side, this is from the top. And on the bottom, so we are comparing what's happening if I have a limited, so to say, interaction. So here, only inter individuals were allowed to interact if the ratings are smaller than, uh, uh, the difference is smaller than 0 0.1. While on the bottom, actually, um, I, it's still the same, but we had a different mechanism. So this was it. We started with two groups. One was overrated and one was underrated. They were both kind of initially located here and here on the top. And what you see is if you have limited interactions and if the beta is equal to zero, which means that they all kind of benefit, then the situation is not going to adjust. You have an overrated group, but they stay in the long term run on the top, while the other ones, I mean, here you can see they move a little bit up. They were originally all located here at 0 0.9. What you get is some kind of diagonal for the behavior, but they don't interact with each other. And since they all always, so to say, improve their strengths, if Peter is equal to 0, there is nothing going to happen. If you play with this Peter, which means that you penalize if you're going to lose, and this is the case if you have overrated players. Um, they actually they play worse than they should be, and you have a beta which is going to penalize this. We start with the same condition, but now everybody moves to the diagonal, so it's kind of adjusting the whole um, situation. So it's kind of really complex dynamics, and playing with the parameters, you can see very different behavior. And the last example is actually something where you would say. Let's play a little bit on the Boltzmann level. So you have interactions, and I have one player which I target, and I call this foul play, in the sense that there's a yellow dot. Everybody else is playing with the normal rules, but I fixed the first player, and the outcome of this game for this player was always shifted towards him, uh, in the benefit towards him. So in expectation, he was, uh, he was winning with a percentage which was I think, yeah, it was 0 0.1 was the value that I always shifted it up. So this means after a while, we see that the rankings of all the other players, they converge to the diagonal thingy, as we expected, while the guy that actually got this benefit, he stays on top. So this is kind of the message that you can try on the microscopic level. If you do um, simulations, you can, so to say, have one player, you tag him, and see what's going to happen. And if you benefit the outcome of the player towards or bias it towards him or her, then this player will stay on top, while the others, as we would expect, really converge towards the strength. Okay, so this was for the ranking, and that's actually all I wanted to say about the ranking and the first part. So we started here with an ELO ranking model, which was, as I said, in very, so this main ingredient to find the natural in the algorithms that are used by chess players and also by the FIFA. The FIFA adapted it for soccer games and they also now have specific rules for friendly games and these kind of things. They are also changing the rules that if you don't play, for example, you are also penalized. So there are a couple of things that are modified, but the rough ingredients of the kinetic model are the same as in the ELO. 
And from there, we started, we introduced the strength and had a look, okay, what's happening if we change the strength and we can get quite rich dynamics. And by adding some randomness, we also see that actually these clear stationary states, if they get blurry, we can't identify them anymore. Okay, so this was the first part that I wanted to show you. In the second, I'm going to change our setting a little bit. So instead of considering players, I'm now talking about agents. And this is a model, as I said, this was proposed by economists. And I don't have that much time, so I will just give you that idea what those guys were interested in. So um, this model was proposed by Benjamin Moll and um, Robert Lucas. Robert Lucas is actually, he got, he got a Nobel Prize in economy. Um, so <coughs> that's what uh, they said, OK? We want to describe knowledge growth in a society, and we want to understand how it relates, actually, to the productivity of the society. And um, somehow, the main ingredients in this model are we have a knowledge level. So each agent has a certain knowledge level, and each agent has a certain amount of time, amount of time, let's say one, that's a fraction of time that I have, or one unit of time. And I can split this time by either to learn or to work. I mean, that's what you can do in this economy, in this model. So you can call it work-life balance, I don't know. But as I said, S is my unit of time. And my productivity relates to my knowledge level. So what they assumed is we have two individuals here. They have two different knowledge levels. And when you have a collision, so to say, that's when you meet, you exchange your knowledge levels. And um, in this case, what they proposed, that was not my idea. So after the collision, actually, the post-collision knowledge level is the maximum of the two values, which is I say it's rather questionable. I mean, one of the nice examples I thought always proposed was like, okay, I'm meeting Martin Burger, I discuss with him, and then after that I know everything what Martin knows, which would be really nice. But unfortunately, this is not the case. But this is what the guys proposed. So we say, okay, we meet, we have three collision of knowledge levels, and afterwards I'm just matching, so to say, to the higher knowledge level, which would be our ideal situation. So if I now have again a distribution of agents, I denote it by F, and C is now my knowledge level, then you can write this as a Boltzmann type equation. So I have the change of the distribution with respect uh, to time, and you have a gain and a loss term. So this is my loss term, this is my gain term. These are all individuals which had a lower knowledge level at that time. They meet with somebody who has a high knowledge level, and so they match it. So those are all the guys, so to say, that instantaneously become smart and have now this knowledge level F of 70. Those are the guys, actually, who the number of guys, so I have F of Z of T, they meet, meet with individuals that have a higher knowledge level, so they immediately adapt their knowledge level, so this is the loss term. The alpha is actually this interaction <coughs> function, and it's the rate at which you interact with others. And since they're economists, they said, okay, now we want to figure out what is the optimal rate. So we want to be um, rational and doing the best here. Okay, so what can we choose? If S is now the time, you remember, this is my fraction of time, they said, okay, this function could be of that form. But that was just my choice. Now the question is, okay, I have to choose how much time do I actually spend on learning? And as I said, I pointed out, we are economists, so we maximize something. First of all, what is the individual productivity in this setting? You say, okay, my individual productivity is 1 minus S of Z of T. That's the time that I spend on working. S of Z is the time that I spend on learning, on fraction, times my knowledge level. Rather simple, but that, so to say, relates <coughs> to productivity. And the total earnings of an economy is just like take all the out or the, the individual productivity and integrate it over the pro uh, distribution of all the agents. So this is the outcome, or so to say, this overall um, outcome of this economy. Now you can say, okay, each agent wants to maximize its earning over a certain time period. So I have my time frame, I discount it in time, and I want to maximize actually my um, my earnings with respect to this uh, uh, constraint looks a little bit weird it would take a bit too much time 
uh, it's in principle, you just need to calculate the Lagrange functional and you get actually the expected value, so to say, if an agent with knowledge level C maximizes this, is given by a Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. So D of Z is the, accepted, uh, the expected outcome, and it looks a bit ugly. I have to fool uh, you with you on that, because if you write down the full system, what you have now is you have F, which is your distribution of your agents, D is your value function, it's a backward in time equation, S, by capital S, I always denote that actually what's the, uh, if I plug in the optimal choice of the S in here, I have an initial condition and I have a terminal mm -hmm. condition. So this was the system that these economists proposed. It was, I think the paper was in 2014. And um, the question, first of all, that when I saw this and also with others was, okay, can we actually prove that there exists a solution to this thing? I mean, we simulated this, this was no, no problem, but okay, but what is actually here, can we say about this? Um, um, let's make life a bit easier at the beginning and say, hmm, what if everybody interacts at a constant rate? So we say that the function alpha is just a constant, so no coupling. So this S that we have is, so to say, gone. Then you can um, say, okay, then the optimal time that I spend on learning is actually equal to zero because I'm going to interact anyway. And your Boltzmann equation, you can write it then in form of the cumulative distribution function, and it has this form. Okay? If you go back to your, uh, I think, yeah, somewhere in PDE classes, I guess, you define G, which is 1 minus F of Z, and you have a Fischer KPP equation. Okay. So in this case, you can have, okay, the system decouples, it gets much nicer. For Fischer KPP, we know a lot. So in this case, we can say, well, it should be fine and we get first insights. What is, however, a bit, okay. Um, the, the next thing is, okay, can I show actually that there exists a solution? What you usually do is you have a look at the problems itself. So we have, you remember the Boltzmann equation and we have the Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. If I now just look at the Boltzmann equation and say, okay, I have an alpha of z of t, so no coupling, it's given, it's a nice function. Um, in this case here it's L1 times L1, so L1 in space, time. Um, can I say actually that this problem has a solution? And the answer is, well, yes, that's actually the Kalindelöf, that's not too hard. So just splitting the problems in two and then trying to do a fixed point argument, that's just the first part, so that's not too hard. But what you immediately say, see is, that if your um, initial datum has a compact support, then actually your solution will converge to a delta Dirac at the maximum of this compact support. And by just thinking about modeling, I mean, if you meet somebody, imagine, with the maximum knowledge, knowledge level, but if your initial distribution has a maximum knowledge level somewhere, then, I mean, if there's a maximum, you can't go beyond that value. That's the end. So this is what's going to happen in this case. You can also have, um, do the same for, or consider the hamilton jacobi bellman equation by itself. So now you assume you have a given distribution F, and have a look, okay, what can I, um, do I have solutions to this equation by itself? You have to have some assumptions on the interaction rates and so on, but in total, what you can say is, okay, the system itself has a solution. And the take-home message of the whole thing, to do a fixed point argument, is back in this paper was we proved that there is a local and time solution to this problem. Um, Alex Lotz actually with Chabin, yeah, Pierre and Chabin, they both told me once that they are sure and very certain that they can extend this to global and time. Unfortunately, Alex left academia and they never wrote it up, so it's a claim that I just have to say now. I don't know it. I haven't seen the argument, so. <laughs> But apparently you can extend this proof to global in time, which is not so good. And back then, when <coughs> we had this result, this was the first paper, I, I, I contacted Ben Moller and said, you know, we proved existence, and he said, so what? <laughs> so that was, didn't impress him, and he was like, you know, what I would really be interested in, if you could tell me that certain types of solutions exist, and I'm like, okay. And the idea is the following. So if you're an economist, then, you might believe in something which is called engineer's growth theory. 
So and it's in principle based on the following observation that if you look at the per capita, um, uh, the, what is it called, the gross domestic product of an economy over a long period of time, then you see that it has exponential growth. So here, you, this is um, actually adjusted due to inflation of the US. This is the GDP. And I mean, here's the Great Depression. So there was this dip. But roughly, you can see, well, it looks like an exponential growth. So what Benjamin Moore asked me was, OK, can I prove, actually, that there exists a solution to this previous model, which ensure that the overall economy, this is this capital Y of T that I showed you at the beginning, actually grows exponentially in time. That's the proof that he wanted to see. He didn't care about any other existence proofs. <laughs> so the question is, can we find a BGP solution to this BMFG model? And he already proposed some scaling, which we, he put in his paper. So what he proposed was the following. If you rescale, so assuming there exists a gross parameter gamma, which is in our class, it should be positive. Then let's consider the following scaling. It looks a bit weird, but OK. We have now, instead of F, capital B, and S, we have our phi, little b, and our sigma here. Um, if I plug this into the system, you do a bit of analysis, then um, you, instead of having a time-dependent system now, we have now an uh, yeah, ODE system with the right hand side with integrals, so, well, whatever you want to call this. This is just plugging everything into my equation. But you can do the same here for this y of t. This is our production function. And if I do this in this way, I plug in this expression for the s, get the sigma, and then my new variable x, and so on, then somehow miraculously there is an e to the power of gamma t popping up in front of it, and so now, if I find such a scaling, or if I find such a gamma, then, okay, I would have exponential growth in my um, overall productivity. So his question was, can I actually find a gamma such that I can do this rescaling? And um, <clears throat> first of all, if you go back to one of the slides that I showed you, there was this example that if you have and my, uh, uh, a bounded, so to say, an upper bound on the knowledge in your initial data, then we've seen that this function f, even so it's also the function phi now, I mean, it's, that's the maximum how smart you can get. If you want uh, exponential growth, you need to make sure that there's, since your productivity relates to your knowledge, so to say, you need to make sure you have enough knowledge out there, far, far away. And I guess you have seen Pareto tales or function with Pareto tales as well. So if I want to make sure that I have enough growth, then I need to have an initial distribution which has fat tails, which is pretty much what is written here. So we need functions that have our initial data that has a Pareto, that, uh, that has a Pareto tail. And then you can play a little bit around. So we can, for example, have a look at this very simple case where I have a constant interaction rate. Then I can actually prove that there exists such a, exponent, a BGP, so a balanced growth path solution, and I can explicitly give it a great growth rate. It depends on the, um, the theta, which comes here from the Pareto tail condition. It depends on the alpha zero and um, on your initial datum, or on the initial distribution of the mass. This is your growth parameters. In this case, you can actually compute it. Um, if you don't have this, then you have again this fully coupled, rather ugly system. So this thing here. Another question is, what do we do if this alpha is a function of sigma? And in this case, I'm actually, since we're all of you probably want to have lunch, I'm just telling you what the problem was. Actually, you do have something which we call degenerate, or they call degenerate BGP paths. So gamma equal to zero is also a solution to the system. So this actually satisfies also your equation. And you want to make sure that you find a gamma which is strictly larger than zero, because I mean, this is, um, otherwise you don't get exponential growth. So when we had to do this fixed point argument, there was quite a bit of work involved that if you do the fixed point argument, that you make sure that you stay away from this zero. Because what you do is you do uh, you solve, so you have 
you go for phi and gamma, given B and S, and you go to B and S, and for given, so you do a fixed point argument. You have to do a couple of technicalities to make sure that you're staying away from this um, degenerate solution. But in the end, we could prove that you act, do have a BGP solution if your initial condition has a parative. I mean, maybe we might like that much more. <laughs> so that's kind of nice. And then we actually added another claim, and I've never, um, I'm sorry, maybe I should show it. So you can also here compare the time dependent versus this BGP solutions. It's again hard to see. But if you start with the right conditions, then, I mean, up to a certain point, uh, computationally, there's always some kind of limit because, uh, uh, yeah, I can't. In some way, I do have to stop my simulation and my, my domain. But for a little while, we really observe this beautiful exponential growth. You can also have linear growth if you don't start with the right conditions, which makes sense. Just to conclude, how can you, other ways to ensure that you do have um, uh, such PGP solutions? You can have a look at this paper by Ashtu and co workers, there's also Ben Moll involved, um, where they actually they, they, they proved, I think, pretty much. And, you know, this kind of mean. They, they didn't prove much, they just threw a whole bunch of problems out there that we, should, that we or anybody should solve. Um, in this paper, they postulated that actually um, diffusion would enhance this growth, and even if you have a completely supported da initial datum, if you add diffusion to the model, so you have knowledge diffusion in the sense that um, you learn even so you don't interact, then you kind of get away. Um, with this Pareto co tail condition. And intuitively, one can go back to this case where you have this constant interaction rate, this alpha zero, and look at the Fisher KPP equation. So you might remember that we have uh, this very simple equation, and then you have traveling wave solutions, and you can prove actually one to one the relation that this minimal wave speed relates to the BGP solutions in logarithmic variables. So there is this one to one um, <coughs> correspondence. If you have the full system, you can do the whole analysis again. I mean, this is just the Boltzmann equation. If you have knowledge diffusion now here, so to say, you can do the same for the BGP. And what they postulated is that this here, which corresponds to the minimal wave speed, actually, of, so translated to the old problem, that's, this is your growth parameter. I've done some numerical simulations. It looks very much like this, but this problem is open. As I said, it's, it's in here. If you're interested in it, so this is the problem you have to go for. If you want to look at simulations, and that's the last slide that I'm going to show you, this is if you, in, if you have some compactly supported initial data, you add some diffusion, so this new is my, um, my diffusion parameter, you see, as I increase it, I really get nice um, exponential growth. This is the function sigma, this is kind of a nice thing here, you see that actually the sigma, it has one means I devote all my time to learning. Up to a certain level, it makes sense that I learn all the time. And then it's a decaying function with your knowledge level because um, after, after that, actually production or producing good is more beneficial for me. And um, if you do the analysis, these are some things that you do always kind of use is that you have, so to say, at the certain, you start out with the maximum value for the sigma or the s, takes one and then it's a decreasing function and so on. So these are some kind of things that um, you also you use in the proof. Just to wrap up, I mean this is another example, but I think in the interest of time, I would say, well, it's a powerful tool, you can do a lot of it and so have fun. And those are the references. And ah yeah, at the beginning this is the original paper. This is I, is the work where you have a whole bunch of problems in there, and this is the original paper by um, Lucas and Moore where they introduced the model, and those, yeah, that's the stuff that I was talking about. Thank you. Concerning the parameters uh, the models are based on, is it possible to estimate them based on observations? <coughs> for the for the ratings? 
Uh, yes, for example, yeah, I, I, I was thinking of your ratings. You know, I, I've, I've been thinking about it, it would make sense. So if you have. So this kind of change, I mean, for the, the parameters you choose in the EVO model, it uh, depends on what kind of. Um, so for the simulations we did, I did it on 0 1. Then I have to adjust the parameters because in the original, as I said, it's between 1,500 and 2,500, and then those gammas, they are actually given online what they choose. So you can play this. Okay, really? Yes. Yeah. So for the, uh, the main algorithm, so it's like 1 over 400 or so. So there are a couple of parameters in there, you can choose them, but depending on how you scale it down, you have to adjust them as well. But yeah, they are, they are actually given. And you can have, there are also big databases of all players, so you can go online and you can have a look at chess player numbers and have all the outcomes of the game. I was thinking once, if one could, or once, I've been thinking about it, how can you use actually this information that I had in the past uh, and put it into the model? Definitely an interesting question, but we haven't looked so far. Um, you could. I think what, what would be possible is you use some kind of, yeah, it's, it's an inverse problem then, so to say, and then have a look at the stationary distribution that you obtain for certain parameter ranges, compare it to the values or this kind of invariant. You assume some prior distribution about your outcome and then try to, yeah. something like that. Okay. Yeah. So concerning your second model, so simply I want to know something. It's very elementary to think that knowledge has no cost. Usually. Mm -hmm. Knowledge has a cost. So mm -hmm. there is a third value that has to be included. <laughs> uh, to learn uh, and to produce, uh, mm -hmm. then I have to pay some price. To yeah. pay some price. If not, it's easy. Yeah, you know. yeah that's true. I mean, there, there, are are, there are papers in this direction. No, this is simply there. I have, I mean, the coupling? No, I think this, there is no extensions of this model. So, so economists think that uh, to learn has no, no price. Well, I uh, no. I mean, he has, for example, but one slide that I skipped was. Now, in in is, this place, we are proving it as a uh, cost, not really. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I, I, he there he discusses a couple of extensions of the model. One, for example, is that you have limits to learning in such a sense that it always depends on the fraction of the knowledge level. I can only adapt. No, but I was asking a completely different Yeah, yeah, I know, but, but he, he also. You have to say, you have an amount of money, you have to decide which amount has to be devoted to learning and which amount has to be devoted to production. This, I think, is the problem. Mm -hmm. Which amount? In terms of money now. Okay, not in no, terms of. In terms of, of global possibilities, you know, you have to choose. Mm -hmm. Since learning has a price, any. So, for example, a country has to decide how much much money to put into knowledge yes. as much money but to wouldn't you put it in yeah. this function here where I say I have to maximize if I'm going to it's not a criticism no no so but I would put simple. it in here saying that actually if I'm going I have some output but I'm going to somehow subtract something depending so on how much I learn it's an optimization with constraint in my opinion it's not a Yes, and it's definitely some worth considering. As I said, this was the raw model that he threw out there and that he had a look at. Um, he had some kind of variations, but not what you mentioned, for example, right now. But there are... It would be testing again. A lot of things you can play with. <laughs> <laughs>